No. Here we go. I'm sure they've seen it. I mean, okay. Aperture already ordered Eden with, uh, with LED, LEDs. Oh, yeah. yeah. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Mic check? Well, let's do this. Did I was on mute the second half of our show yesterday? Mm. I muted during the thing just in case. And I never unmuted. Huh? Yeah? I know. I mean, granted, I think there's so many microphones around that didn't matter much. It sounded kind of low. Three, two, three. Woo! What's up, Wish Heads? Welcome back to Inspire. The day first... four. Yes. It's been a long week. It has. Day four. <laughs> we got one more day to go. Today is going to be super awesome. Um, here with Dimitri from Treasure Corps. Yeah, we got a really special interview for you guys today. But first, make sure you guys smash that like button. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Hit the notification bell. We're giving away $1,500 on this episode, just like the Wowza. last three episodes. Yep. Uh, you want to tell them how to get that? Yep. So we have three $500 Water Best gift cards that we're giving away um, on the Inspire page. On this block for the stream, there is an enter giveaway button. Click that. Get entered. You have until 645 Eastern to enter that. It's only open for the first 45 minutes. Then it closes. We'll announce those winners at the end of the stream. And then we also have a grand prize giveaway that's been open for the last uh, couple weeks. This one is open until tomorrow at 645. So if you haven't entered, entered in. And that one, we're actually going to announce the winner on Monday the 22nd on a special mm -hmm. live stream at 6 p.m. But that one's only open until then. But for this stream, three five hundred dollar box cards, well, water box gift cards. <laughs> Enter now, first forty five minutes. And um, people have asked, there's no bonus word. I know we've done bonus words in previous events. There is no bonus word for Inspire. Yep. So definitely get in there. Again, waterboxaquariums.com forward slash Inspire to get entered into that giveaway. It's going to end at 645 today. Um, the sales are going on right now in the USA, Canada, Europe, and the United Kingdom. You can save up to 20% off on aquariums and supplies. So take advantage of that. Don't wait to try to win something. If you do win something, we'll credit you back. Yeah. Um, get your tanks ordered. You do not want to miss out on this opportunity to save quite a bit of money on either a water box or supplies. Yep. I do want to also mention, we are going to have Dimitri on over Skype for live Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, so you do want to get your questions dropped in there throughout the video. Anything mm -hmm. you want to ask him about his beautiful setups, how he does stuff. Uh, we're going to go over a lot of information in the video, but any other questions, put them in there because he is going to—he's taking his time to come and do live Q and A for you guys. So that'll be yeah. after the video. Yep. Um, so drop your questions in there throughout the whole thing, um, and we'll grab as many as we can. Yeah, and that video will end right around or a little after the 6:45 mark when the uh, giveaway ends. Yep. Um, so many of you already probably know Dimitri with Treasure Corals from his YouTube, Instagram, social. Mm -hmm. He's you know very big on there. A lot of amazing videos. But you know we are diving in deep with him into his water boxes. He's had multiple and now recently moved into an LX model. Um, so we're really talking a lot of details about that, learning mm -hmm. a bit more. And if you don't know who he is, here's a great introduction. Um, and you're definitely going to follow him after this, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take a look. We want to welcome Dimitri here with us today. He has had not only one, but three water box setups over yes. the year. Beautiful reef tank. Uh, so welcome, Dimitri. Coming all the way from Toronto, Canada. Uh, hi, Richard and Jessica. And I'm extremely happy and honored to uh, be featured today. Happy to have you. Awesome. All right. So you have, oh, we have a whole bunch of great stuff to talk about, but I kind of want to start with like, where did you get started in the hobby? How long ago was it? What got you involved in all of it? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I would say that um, keeping uh, aquariums, I think, uh, is in my blood. Um, ever since I was, uh, I think, four years old, as I remember myself, I would be uh, very interested in keeping something aquatic. So first it would be just a jar, like a mason jar, and it would be some bugs. Later on it would be guppies. And when I moved to... Canada from Russia. I was born in St. Petersburg. Um, eventually, um, we got our first uh, fish tank. Actually, my wife, uh, spur of the moment, got a fish tank. Um, everybody uh, died uh, three <laughs> days later because of the nitrogen cycle. And I inherited uh, that tank, and the rest is history. This is probably my 25th tank, if I were to guess, maybe even more. So 
uh, it is a problem, but it's also <laughs> um, I really, really love uh, doing so. So you're like really long-term hobbyist here. So that's pretty awesome. So definitely it is an addiction. Yes. Um, and honest. you've had quite a few water boxes of those possible 25 total aquariums. And we're going to talk a bit about those. But, you know, how did you find water box like originally? And what made you decide to use water box for your reefs? Well, um, I have first... First of my aquariums, when I got into saltwater, were uh, all custom. And especially when I started out about 15 years ago, uh, there was really nothing uh, that was available on the market um, that was pre-made. Uh, I think there was like a few models out there, but they were a little bit clunky and there was not a lot of front to back uh, distance. Um, eventually, after my very large tank, which I really loved uh, it was my six footer um, that was custom made by miracles um, I wanted to downgrade because we were moving at the time so I got myself a smaller tank which was the Red Sea and um, if you actually go on my YouTube channel you'll see uh, it's probably one of my most popular videos from a good 10 years ago now when I um, have been starting when I started looking for a newer tank um, I looked at the market and uh, one of the most important uh, qualities for me was the front to back uh, distance of the tank. And especially at that time, water box was by far the best option. Like when I saw the dimensions, uh, they really spoke to me. Uh, my first tank was 180.5 Pro model, which was a five foot uh, in uh, width. And it was beautiful front to back. Um, I don't believe in tanks less than, let's say, 24 inches. And I think it was even longer or taller from that perspective. Uh, perfect dimensions. You could still kind of move it with just a few buddies. And um, the quality also uh, was really impressive at the time. It was Starfire uh, all around, like a crystal clear glass. Um, the uh, I really like the fact that the overflow was glass so it was really easy to clean and uh, it was just you know no expenses spared uh, top of the line beautiful white finish um, it was the tank that i just fell in love with and um, i must say i got more than four years out of it and uh, there's already some people that uh, want to get it uh, now and i see another probably easy 10 years in it so it's it looks brand new to me even right now that's awesome. So the measurements were a big play in that. So you're saying that your very first water box was the Reef 180.5. Um, you know, tell us a bit about that setup. You know, anything that you, you know, notable as far as equipment and livestock, any ups and downs that kind of happened through those four years? Yes. Um, so because I've been uh, doing this for quite some time, I've had a lot of ups and downs uh, in this hobby and quite a few times, I'll be honest, um, you wanted to throw in the towel, uh, so to speak, because I've gone through a few cases where during the move, I actually lost, I wouldn't say 80% of my coral, which was devastating. But uh, that also kind of uh, cleared the path for me to um, really explore what I could do with the new tank. Um, and if I document all of my journeys, so on my YouTube channel, um, I try to post almost weekly um, videos and the whole point is to show other reefers out there that it's not always you know pristine and it's all, not always uh, super uh, healthy uh, you will go through ups and downs um, in my particular case I've uh, envisioned it first as a mixed reef then at some point it morphed uh, probably two three years later more into uh, SPS dominant and then at some point when I started farming, I figured this would be my easy reef. So I got into LPS and it was all softies, which was phenomenal. And then it kind of came back to the mixed reef again, which was, I found very fascinating the fact that you could, out of the same box, use have a completely different tank with a different type of coral. Um, my fish selection was more or less the same, but uh, in terms of the coral and the aquascape, this is where every year was a completely different experience. So that one went through a lot of changes for livestock. That is correct. <laughs> and um, it was also the aquascaping that I think was one of the most um, exciting 
uh, aspects um, of, of this thing because again with the front to back distance this is where I find you have the most creative freedom and the more space you have the more uh, layout options you have for the tank and I'm trying to always uh, set up something that looks very natural. Nice. What was some key equipment that you ran on that? I know it might have changed when you changed your different livestock, or did you pretty much keep it the same for the, the four years? Well, um, some of uh, the, your viewers may recognize me um, as um, the Aqua Illumination Signature Series. I think um, I'm the second there after David Saxby, and you can actually uh, go to the Mobius app and uh, download my schedule. But uh, for my display tanks, I was a huge proponent of Hydra lights. Um, and later on, it was blades. And I think the Hydras just spoke to me because of the very natural uh, look that I could get. It was probably the closest to metal halides that um, I could actually experience. So Hydras, uh, first, uh, I think it was the 52, then it was 64 HDs. And then um, later on, when the blades uh, came out, I've switched to blades and uh, never looked back. The tank behind me is also running blades. Mm -hmm. As for the rest of the equipment, um, it was all Ecotech um, and a mixture of AI. So uh, MP40s, I think on all of my tanks, um, are, there is MP40s. But I also would use that to try out the new Nero 7 when it came out, as well as the uh, mm -hmm. Orbit. Um, so I like that everything is in one ecosystem. My pumps are all Ecotech as well. So I can control everything with uh, just uh, one app. And nowadays with the integration with Neptune, um, it just all works uh, phenomenally uh, well. And there is Trident, which uh, I'm really excited about as well. You got all the bells and whistles going on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you keep your filtration relatively simple, but as automated as possible? Yes, and uh, uh, I must admit, I've never used a filter roller in my life. I know a lot of people uh, get excited about them, and uh, maybe at some point I will. Uh, but most of the time, I actually don't use any mechanical filtration on, on the tank. Um, sometimes I use filter socks whenever I need to, for example, deal with something or let's say I've stirred up the sand and uh, the rest of the time it's um, just goes through and um, somehow it's not a big issue. It's never been a big issue for me. Uh, I believe in uh, feeding the coral heavily and uh, most of the time I think the corals just uh, extract all of those particles or the water changes uh, take care of it or the skimmer. Do you run a refugium or did you run a refugium on the Reef 180? I uh, have experimented with refugiums, uh, so over those four years I've done every probably single setup you can imagine. So I've done the cryptic zones, I've done the um, refugium with uh, Cheto, uh, Chetomorpha, as, as well as I've also done uh, like a, I reused, repurposed that uh, refugium section for my coral uh, frag farming setup. So it, it, at some point it was that. So I've done everything. Um, can't really say um, one thing is better than the other, but uh, I think the cryptic zone required the least uh, amount of fuss in my experience. All right, been through a whole bunch of changes. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so that one was still up and running and you got your second water box or did it transfer into your second water box? No, um, as um, I think some of uh, your viewers may relate, um, it is a problem um, where sometimes one aquarium is not enough. So <laughs> there's flows. Um, and I remember many years back when I was in a small apartment, uh, if you don't let yourself, uh, you know, uh, if you, you let yourself lose, you can easily end up with 10 aquariums. So I um, sometimes uh, would even get that. So this was one experience where I wanted uh, a second tank uh, just to focus on SPS coral because okay. this was more of an LPS. And so I was transitioning between a mixed reef to uh, a little bit more focused reef. So this uh, for a year or two became the LPS system or softy. And uh, my SPS system was the new water box, which was the Infinia four foot uh, aquarium, which uh, was 
quite uh, something I, I'm very fond of. Awesome. So how long ago did you set that one up and tell us a bit about it? Sure. Um, so it was about a year, uh, maybe even a little bit more. And uh, that particular system uh, was all about the SBS. So I really like the fact um, it's, it's always about the balance. It's always um, on one hand, you want to go bigger, but on the other hand, a uh, four foot tank. Remember I said that, you know, the five foot tank, four uh, guys could probably move it. Mm -hmm. The four footer, I can just uh, call up a buddy and if we want to move it from one room into another, we can do that no problem. So that's super uh, useful and, and that kind of played into um, the selection of the tank at the time. Plus, SBS are harder to keep, they, uh, they're more expensive, so I didn't want to go, uh, you know, massive at, at the time, but I wanted to focus on um, the aesthetics and the colors, and this was my playground for my Acropora dominant uh, system, so where I could try no sand for a little bit, so I tried that and just blast uh, all the Acropora with as much flow as I could throw at it, but then uh, this was the playground where I could then dial back and, and try all the different uh, methodologies of there until I found something that really worked for me. Speaking of bare bottom, off contract, but what do you think of, I see that it, in the video it has sand. Did you go back to sand after trying bare bottom? Very quickly. I <laughs> just cannot, um, I, it just does not work for me. Uh, there's just something about... Uh, white sand bed that makes or breaks an experience for me. Um, it, I, I could not enjoy the aquarium as much as when there was uh, the sand bed. I know we get that question a lot and I always say that. I was like, I tried bare bottom too, but I couldn't deal with it not looking natural. So I always end up going back to sand. It's a bit too sterile. Yeah, you know, so that, good to know um, and I know opinions vary a lot. So with this being like a full SBS system, what lighting did you run on the Infinia? Well, um, the Infinia worked out well um, with the timing of blade release. So I started out with the Radiance first. So it was the XR30 uh, G5s and kind of dialed them in. It was perfect coloration. But then uh, when the blades uh, hit the market, um, I First tried them on the five footer, and at the same time I was just so impressed with the low profile. So I did something very special with uh, the four foot uh, tank there. If you may uh, notice in the videos, you'll see there's a little strip uh, of black tape that I put in just to hide that um, a gap with the air, the air gap, and um, that really transformed uh, the, the aquarium because I took the blades. And I put them in line with uh, the surface of the tank. What mm. that gave me is basically a very unique look uh, where there's no light above the tank. It's just a box. And I'm extremely um, uh, particular about the stray light. I think that the light has to go inside of the aquarium. So this was just a, a different way to experiment with, uh, with the setup. Um, so the blades, it was three blade grows um, and I had exceptional results as you can see um, in some of my videos. So your SPS system run, was run 100% on the blades? Yes, blade grows. Wow, okay. Very cool. I'm sure people will be awesome to hear that. Um, you know, for your equipment, was it pretty much similar to the other one as far as Ecotech and AI? Did you run a refugium on this one? No, uh, the uh, one caveat was that uh, at the time I actually plumbed it um, into my farm. Uh, it was just something different. Um, I uh, have not actually used the sample on that particular aquarium because I wanted a different challenge um, of trying to run things through the walls and I did the whole uh, plumbing by myself. But this way I was able to capitalize on the water volume and also ease up the water testing because with multiple systems in the house one of the biggest issues for me is the water testing and I just don't have enough time so I'm always trying to streamline it and I've never done a uh, plumb tank uh, before so this was my experience with uh, that one and uh, it, was, it was pretty cool at the time. Nice, awesome. Yeah. Very cool. So Dimitri, 
Let me uh, just to clarify, you you took these two tanks down, right? So those tanks are no longer set up. To, that to, is correct. To merge into what's behind you, which is the Reef LX uh, 340.7. Tell us yes. a little bit about the process of tearing that down. I mean, I saw some pictures that you had sent me and it looked like you, you definitely, it wasn't an easy transition, but t give us some more detail. Give the viewers some detail about what that process looked like. Okay. Um, so when I embarked on that journey, um, I wish I knew what I was getting myself into because uh, with all of the years of me um, keeping different aquariums, I've never uh, faced with a bigger challenge in, in my opinion. Um, so going from fresh water to salt water, one of the most eye-opening experiences for me was that uh, issue of scalability um, in the sense that if you have a 20 gallon aquarium and then you want to uh, go to a 40 gallon aquarium, so you're doubling it, you your issues uh, and expenses and the livestock, everything just doubles, which is kind of not the same in the freshwater, at least as I remember. Uh, going from 50 gallon to 100 gallon was actually easier in many ways. In salt water, it kind of scales in terms of the complexity. And I think probably the six footer is the tipping point or five footer, because when I got into a seven footer, um, I was overwhelmed uh, by the logistics. This was actually a real project and I had to write it out on a piece of paper. I did whole project management behind this. I had to plan uh, not only the delivery of uh, the aquarium, which was uh, a very um, massive job where I used professionals to bring it in on a special dolly. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the first time when Waterbox was uh, trying to get delivered to uh, my uh, house, uh, the car came, or oh, sorry, the truck came, and they could not get it outside of uh, the truck. So uh, we had to, had to work with uh, Jessica to find uh, an alternative uh, movers, and then they were able to bring it in, into my garage. But then I had to use a different company to help me get it in here professionally. So just getting the tank in is no longer just calling a couple of uh, friends and you know having a beer afterwards it is a real project same goes for electricity you need a lot more electricity you have to plan for this and you have to have um, uh, electrical experience from that perspective and then um, it's just the planning so you have two aquariums uh, luckily because i have a farm i was able to um, First, empty the five-footer and move everything into the farm without losing any livestock and having all the filtration still going. The four-footer was still hooked up into the system. And then once I have set up uh, this aquarium, so it was in place, I spent several days just moving it maybe by half an inch, just making sure that it's sitting perfectly where I want it. Uh, I made sure that this is kind of the final uh, place. I also uh, did all the leveling on the aquarium and it took me um, several days to do it right. I used multiple levels. I used uh, laser levels as well because I am a big believer that the tank has to be absolutely perfect. And I must say that this tank, which is uh, over seven feet long, um, I think maybe there's a one millimeter uh, high difference. And that is even questionable between the left and right side. So uh, that is super important to me, and this is what I did in advance. Once the tank was set up properly, um, the actual move was super easy. I filled it up with water. Um, I also used the water box salt, um, which um, was pretty cool. You, I, you could just take the bag, throw it in there with distilled water. Uh, the tank took almost 10 days to fill with distilled uh, mm. RO water. I did not expect that uh, at all. It was, uh, it was like uh, watching the paint uh, dry. Uh, so, but uh, that part was done. Um, the tank was full. And then uh, I heated up the water, mixed up the salt. And really, the actual move of the livestock took uh, less than a day. I put in the sand, uh, let the water kind of calm down a little bit from the cloudiness. And then I took all the live rock from uh, my holding farm uh, place. Place it right there, and you can see, and we can talk about the aquascape, but right now there's no aquascape in this tank. Right now, it's only 26 days old, 
And the goal is just to make sure that the biological filtration is there. So I moved all the rock in there. It was uh, good sand as well. Um, I had lots of filter media that went into the sump. Um, so technically, the tank was cycled on the day one because all of the fish that you see here behind me, all of that fish went in on that one day and um, I did not have any problems. One other uh, kind of trick was using corals in the tank on day one. I'm a big believer and I think, uh, you know, later on it was confirmed by late uh, Jake Adams um, that corals you can easily put in uh, on the first day of setting up the tank. Um, I never ran in to any um, kind of ugly stage, really. Uh, you can see the sand and everything else is, is looking good for a 26-day uh, uh, aquarium. And um, just now it's a bit of a waiting game, but now I'm embarking on the process of uh, the next steps of setting up the aquascape the way I like it. Excellent. <clears throat> You're making my job easy, Dimitri. You answered many of the <laughs> questions that I had lined up for you, but that's all really good information. Uh, for the viewers when they're considering getting, you know, either upgrading or getting into a big system yeah. like this, because there are a lot of things to consider. Like you said, even the delivery can be challenging. Um, this one it was. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So sometimes these these tanks, I mean, they're sometimes they have to come out with a forklift. Yeah. So sometimes the delivery driver is not exactly Confident. comfortable. So we have to arrange other things. Um, if you had to do this same upgrade over again, what would you have done differently? Uh, I'll say, um, and I, I know uh, when you and I, Richard, talked, uh, you were talking about the custom, and um, I did not really spend a lot of time thinking about that, um, but going forward, and I think actually for where it's at right now, I don't think I would do anything differently. Like that particular set of dimensions worked out perfectly and exactly what I was looking for. But in a, maybe in, in another house, in another place, I'd probably strongly look at the custom options for um, what, what's there. And then I would, would have probably tailored it even more to maybe uh, what that particular place um, um, spoke for um, or required. Um, but honestly, I think the dimensions, when I saw them, that really clicked. Uh, the remember I keep uh, hankering the uh, solution the point that it's all about um, the front to back distance for me as well and uh, this tank um, instead of 26 inches it's almost 30 inches front to back and I can yeah. tell you I'm getting every single inch out of it and it's perfect in my ideal world I'd be going for 36 or even more but there's just that's where you start losing practicality of, of those things. Um, so right now, this is, as far as I know, this is probably the perfect dimensions for me at the moment. Amazing. Um, let's talk a little bit about your equipment on this aquarium. Tell us about sure. your lighting, your filtration. Um, what are you, what exactly are you running on this one? So um, this is where I'm not deviating from the path that I've uh, mentioned earlier. So in terms of the lighting, uh, I'm using blades. Now, what I'm doing differently uh, in this aquarium is I am using a mixture of both grows and glows. So when the grows and glows came out, uh, I very quickly uh, preferred the grows for the color spectrum. And also, if you're limited to the number of blades that you can fit on the tank, um, I think that the grows just uh, work a little bit better for me. Having said that, uh, here there's six blades. So it's a lot, it's a very wide tank, and I'm just using the biggest um, setup of uh, blades, and it's um, two to one. So two, two grows, one glow, and uh, I'm right now dialing in the uh, spectrum, but I absolutely love it. This is perfect, it's a uh, very low profile. Um, I'm still um, working through the, both the light spectrum, but also where how the lights are positioned. They're a little bit higher, so that's one of the reasons you cannot even see them in the picture because I'm still working on the tank. I still need to have a lot of access to it. But later on, I'm going to be lowering them down a lot closer to uh, the water surface. And I also use uh, just four MP60s at the moment. There's two on each side. So my first time using MP60s. I've always used MP40s. And um, after that, looking at uh, MP40s on uh, my 
in a farm. It's it looks like a toy. Uh, those <laughs> things are just uh, just insane. Like how big they are, how powerful they are. Very quiet. So uh, great experience there. And my uh, uh, pump is the return pump is at the moment uh, Vectra L2, which again is just a staple. I think should be in uh, most large tanks out, out there. So absolutely love the whole setup. And uh, it's uh, controlled by Neptune. Um, and I also use Trident and I use Mobius for the app. Very nice, very nice. Uh, all great information for viewers, obviously looking to, to set up a bigger tank like that. I, I find the blade using p just blades very interesting, but yeah. I think uh, that opens up a lot of possibilities for people. I think even in some cases, economically, it's it's good. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about your livestock. What's your plans with the livestock? Is this going to be a mixed reef? Tell us about the fish. Did the fish come over from the previous systems? Okay, so uh, multiple questions here. Uh, so I'll unravel uh, all of them. Um, first, I will start saying that every single aquarium that I have, um, I've always tried to name the aquarium. So it was, it would be, you know, my one of my first uh, saltwater tanks that I started to document on YouTube was called Winterfell Reef. It was during the uh, Game of Thrones uh, time period, so obviously. Their next one was Pragmatic Reef, then it was Practical Reef. Uh, uh, the first water box was uh, Treasure Reef, and this is where and I got my handle, the Treasure Corals. But uh, this particular one I'm calling Experience. And when I say experience, I'm not talking about, oh my God, you know, somebody has got experience. Uh, this is more, I'm experiencing the tank. The goal is to experience the reef as if you are uh, out in the wild. And mm -hmm. so everything else comes after that or comes out of that. Um, uh, to elaborate, uh, it's going to be a mixed reef. Um, so I want it to be uh, as balanced and natural as possible. I want it to evoke the feeling of being basically having a window into the ocean. That is the goal. And then how I'm going to get there is painstakingly trying to find just the right balance of uh, the corals, making sure that it's not over dominated by one or the other. And I get that in many real biotopes, it's really just only one set of corals, but this is uh, an artistic uh, vision. Um, and uh, basically, it's going to be a mixture of uh, SPS, uh, Acropora, Mantipora, as well as many uh, colorful LPS. I don't think I'm going to be going too high end. This is uh, a very large uh, aquarium, and I don't have that uh, type of finances to get all the fancy Walt Disney's of the world. But <laughs> I'm also a big believer in um, just basic coral. I find that, uh, for example, one of my favorite fish is just regular clown. I've never had any fancy clowns because I think that the clowns that you can see on the right are the best uh, percular clowns uh, out there. When it comes to fish, um, I currently um, am just keeping the fish that I've had, some of them for 10 years, um, and I'm going to be adding more fish. I'm toying with an idea of doing angels. Um, I've always wanted an emperor angel and regal angel. There's going to be a flame angel uh, here, which I had in my four foot tank with exceptional results. Um, but my next couple of fish on the list are clown tank. And I want to, um, so when I was getting the tank, there's really just one fish that just came uh, to my mind. And this is what I want to experience. And this is the Sohel tank. This is, I think, the fish that is uh, appropriate for this type of an aquarium, this very long aquarium. And um, my vision for the fish is to make sure that it's as natural as possible. Um, I'm a big fan of many uh, YouTube channels out there and, and, and uh, aquarists that have large aquariums. Uh, obviously, you know, Mike Paletta, Sanjay, and for uh, a lot of them, they experience things that you would not experience in the smaller aquarium, such as coral spawning or uh, courtship behavior of the fish or something that would be very authentic to um, like when you are actually diving. And these are the things that I'm trying to or but this is my vision to get out of this aquarium. I want to say be sitting here uh, in the evening with a glass of wine and uh, just kind of 
oh my God, uh, did you just see what that fish did? This is <laughs> kind of what my vision is. Whether I'm going to get there, that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dimitri, you really spoke to me when you when you mentioned uh, the types of corals, like the, the more common corals, because I've always been a huge fan. I don't know if you know this. I love the easy, more common, yeah. easier to obtain, more economical corals. I think that, you know, they're often overlooked, especially with the craze of the designer corals, which I never really got into. Um, so I like that a lot. Be nice. Yeah. So we talked about the fish all kind of came over. So with your coral, I know you took down the two aquariums and put those corals into your farm. Are you planning all of them to go back into this one? Or are you kind of selecting and being kind of choosing on which ones, cutting any down? Like what's going to be your process with all those corals? Uh, this is an excellent question. And uh, on one hand, I think I have an answer, but on the other hand, it keeps uh, changing. Um, I am trying to simplify things uh, to a certain degree. And I know it's kind of um, intuitive because I'm going larger. So it's not really a simplification. But at the same time, um, I think I want to um, achieve balance in the aquarium. I want not very large corals. I don't want overpowering corals. And it's going to be a, a process of uh, just continuously changing things up. I don't think this is going to be final. Um, I will be uh, you, uh, riding on the opportunity of having a farm to take probably the corals that speak the most to me for that particular season and just kind of planting them here. All of my corals are packed on little uh, stems. So all of my uh, rock work is drilled. So I can actually easily move things around and nothing mm. is permanent. This is something that I've been using for many years. And uh, this particular way, I can shift things up, I can play with the color, I can play with the uh, coral selection and uh, just see where, where it takes me. So that we, that is the journey I'm embarking on and uh, I have no idea where it's gonna take me either. That's <laughs> a, I think that's the best way to do it though, is like, you know, you're gonna play stuff, move it, and you know, find that perfect balance. So you've mentioned mm -hmm. your farm a few times. Tell us a little bit about your, your farm you have going on. Well, uh, this is a, a custom tank um, that is six feet by thirty. Sorry, six, yeah, six feet by thirty-six inches. Um, it's uh, fairly short, but it's also um, just kind of perfect um, dimensions. And this is where I remember I, in, in some of my aquariums before, especially the large ones, I would try to reuse the sump for all the coral. Like I just feel bad when you you get successful with the coral. Like what do you do with the excesses of it? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can bring them to the store, which is great, and um, I'm happy to do that, but sometimes the stores don't want to take it. Um, and uh, this is where you either give it to your friends or you try to, let's say, sell it in the aftermarket uh, on Kijiji. And this is where having a dedicated farm is, is very useful. Um, I do have uh, a website, and I try to take good photos and, and, and try to offer it uh, to... Um, you know, people here in Canada, you cannot ship to U.S., unfortunately, but uh, I've shipped all across uh, Canada with success. So um, the real reason for this, there's multiple reasons. One is it's a bank. So uh, if there is a, some sort of a swing in alkalinity in one aquarium, you still have a piece of coral in another. So it, it requires extra work. It requires extra uh, testing, but I think it's worth it. And the other thing, which um, is what keeps me in this hobby, is ability to experiment. Um, having multiple aquariums allows me to try out new equipment, um, sometimes not on the primary tank, but on the secondary tank. Uh, sometimes try, uh, I can try out the new methodology and you, oh, see how we go through all these cycles. And, you know, there is always a next flavor of the month. So having two aquariums helps me with that. So I find that that and also the ability to just kind of go uh, downstairs on the weekend and just spend the next couple of uh, hours f focusing on the corals and geeking out on the coral coloration mm. is just a uh, great uh, pastime for me. I always enjoyed it and it's like going to a store, but you have it in your house. 
<laughs> and lucky for those in Canada that they can get some corals from you too. So yeah, that's great. That is cool. So of all the fish and corals you have there now, whether, whether in the LX or in your farm, one of each, what is your favorite? Uh, the corals, uh, I would say, oh my God, uh, that goni behind me on the on the right, the red one, um, mm -hmm. I have abysmal um, track record with gonies. I've uh, killed too many, I want to admit. Um, so it's the ones that uh, make it through is the ones that uh, you really start to appreciate. There's just something about the goni that I absolutely love. Um, I do like my green slimer a lot, which uh, you can also see behind me i've placed mm -hmm. it right there and uh well now everybody loves torches uh, i don't have anything like super fancy but i think the uh, the torches uh, speak to me oh there is one coral that i think if i were to pick i would say this is my absolute uh favorite and this is the one that you can see all the way in the corner that big brain coral and the reason for that is i got this coral over 10 years ago for my birthday and it was uh, probably the size of my fist. Now it's, I don't know, 10 times bigger in mass. And it's gone through ups and downs. At some point, I thought I almost lost it. And so when they come back, this is where you really try to appreciate it even more. And I would say that probably I would pick that coral as my absolute favorite. That's awesome. Nice. How about a favorite fish? Do you have one? Very easy. Powder blue tank. Um, okay. Anybody who's... Uh, knows my YouTube channel, knows that uh, I didn't even have to think uh, a microsecond there. Uh, <laughs> this is a fish that got me into the hobby. This is a very challenging fish. It took me uh, months and years to really figure out how to keep them. And um, now I have them in both aquariums. And just there's something about that color combination and, and the attitude of the fish that <laughs> just speaks to me. So it's absolute perfect fish in my opinion. I do love a powder blue tang. They're they are blue, absolutely yeah. beautiful. Um, and we had talked, you kind of talked about it briefly earlier, is that you are using Waterbox Reef Salt. Um, how do you like that? What are your favorite things about it? You know, what made you want to use that salt? Well, um, uh, I uh, picked up uh, Richard's offer on trying it out. So he suggested that uh, I'll give it a try. And um, I figured I've used every single salt uh, under the sun, um, sometimes with good results, sometimes with bad. Uh, and uh, this particular one, I, I, I figured this is a brand new uh, chemistry. I can just start uh, from scratch. So I've used it. Um, I really liked it. I think the corals reacted very well. Um, so going from my other system, which has been using another salt, uh, bringing them here, uh, I haven't skipped a bit. Everybody's uh, puffy and uh, open and beautiful colors. Um, I also did an ICP test on both this tank and also on the one uh, that, uh, which is my farm with a different salt. And um, I'm going through the results right now and I'm going to be posting a video shortly on that. But love the salt. Um, this is, it makes it really easy. Um, I think it uh, checks off the boxes for me. Excellent. Great to hear. We think the same thing. Um, so with the LX, I know it's a little bit newer, so you might not have too much maintenance kind of going into it yet. But like, what is your general on um, past ones or this one, like maintenance schedule, water changes, and just general upkeep that you go through? So uh, probably for the past uh, eight years or so, I've always tried to use uh, automatic water changes to utilize automatic water changes because uh, the days of uh, lugging the, bu uh, the uh, buckets are over. Um, I'm never going to do that again. And uh, it's not one of those cases where I can really easily open up a siphon and get tons of water because only if I can automate it or make it super easy, I'm going to be doing. It. So right now, automatic water changes is, is the way to go. I'm using the Ecotech Versa. I've used it for since it came out. And, uh, you know, there's been a few ups and downs, but Overall, I think it, it does the job uh, well. You still have to pay attention to your salinity. This is where I use my Neptune to uh, let me know. I also do things manually. And uh, other than the water changes, I uh, do clean the glass. I really like the uh, water box uh, cleaner. Um, so there's massive ma uh, magnet. Um, I like the wooden handle. This is one of the reasons like I really like what... Uh, what a box is doing is the this attention to details like 
not just putting like a plastic handle on it, but a piece of wood. These are the uh, things that uh, make up with experience. Um, and it's all about the experience um, of, of the aquarium. Other than cleaning the glass, I don't know if there's anything else. One thing I will be doing now, uh, which I didn't do before, and I hope this is uh, going to be a tip for others, is um, I will be uh, cleaning the teeth on the overflow with a uh, brush uh, regularly. So I'll try to stick to maybe two, three weeks, every two, three weeks to do that, because to prevent any coralline algae to grow. Because once you actually have the coralline algae, it's very hard to get it uh, outside of the teeth. And this is where uh, I'm going to add it to my uh, maintenance. As you can tell from your previous uh, water boxes and this one, that you are loving the clean back glass and <laughs> overflow is spotless. Um, I can is... appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I am, I'm a stickler for that. I always want all the panels clean. Which is, is why the yes. overflow box was made glass when we yeah. designed it, is yeah. to keep that perfectly clean. So you're definitely taking care of that. Um, so like for those watching who are maybe don't even have their first aquarium yet or thinking about getting into salt water. So for that very beginner, what would be that number one piece of advice you would give them? Uh, learn to enjoy what you do. Um, when I don't think of what I do as a chore, because if you start thinking about um, cleaning the skimmer or cleaning the glass as a, as a chore, then you will rob yourself from uh, of uh, the pleasure of keeping it, and then it will become a chore. When I spend my Sunday morning actually cleaning uh, the glass or working on the tank, I try to enjoy every part of it. Um, and my other uh, advice would probably be to uh, learn from others, watch as, as many YouTube channels as you can, but also know that it's not always what um, you will see like on this beautiful Instagram reel where everything is spotless. You, everybody goes through ups and downs. There's never been an aquarium in my life where when I have friends come over and like, oh, your tank is looking exceptional. I'll be going, yes, maybe 80%. It works, it looks great, but I can name you 10 things that are completely wrong with my <laughs> Um, li livestock or with the coral or with a certain fish behavior, there's always something which is part of the hobby. So just embrace everything and uh, know that it's not perfect. Uh, we were just working with uh, uh, entropy. That's true. I think that has a really good advice just for the fact that like if you have your first couple bumps on the road when you have your aquarium, like some people might get very discouraged because they see everyone posting perfect aquariums and not really yeah. talking too much about the bad that can happen with it. Um, but you said, I don't care how long you've been doing it, every aquarium is going to have some things that aren't perfect. You're going to go through some different stuff. So um, don't get discouraged if you're having a little bit of a bad spell or hit the crazy algae. Um, since you just went through it of moving and upgrading to a very large aquarium, what is a piece of advice you would give someone who's thinking about going bigger? Well, uh, that whole idea of the scaling, like know what you're getting yourself into, uh, probably worth, uh, in the end, uh, run, but in the long run, but this is where trying to, I guess, anticipate, uh, and issues as they come uh, about and. I've had a few, and also not rushing through things, uh, taking your time. Uh, as I think Mike Paletta had said uh, before, nothing good uh, happens fast in this hobby, but everything bad happens fast. And I swear by uh, these, these words. So taking your time and planning and knowing that uh, things may still not go according to that, but again, embracing um, that experience. That's great Wonderful. advice. Yeah. I know you talked a lot about videos that you post and kind of following along with your aquariums. You know, let our viewers know where on social media, YouTube, website, all of the places that can find you to keep an eye on all your cool stuff. Thanks. Uh, so right now the moniker is Treasure Corals. This is kind of something I think because uh, I actually treasure um, those corals. This is kind of where it came from. Uh, my handle on YouTube and on Instagram is uh, Treasure Corals. Um, I'm very active on YouTube and have been for the past uh, 10 plus years. Um, now Instagram, I'm starting to get into it and uh, I already see um, quite a lot of uh, viewers and, and followers, which is great. 
And I also have treasurecorals.com uh, website where um, I do a lot of uh, 3D printed stuff uh, that I design myself. Um, it's all unique design. So like all those visors for um, your um, different lights, I come up with them and, and make. And uh, I also um, have, uh, I can recommend aquatic log. So when I got into the hobby, um, at the time, which was probably 15 years ago, uh, everybody was using at best an Excel spreadsheet or notepad to keep <laughs> track of water parameters. And because I'm a programmer by trade, I put together a website called aquaticlog.com and uh, it was geared towards uh, all the aquarists in the world, uh, helping them document and keep track of their aquarium journey and also keep track of their water parameters. Now uh, there is an iPhone app, an Android app, which I also make myself. And uh, we've passed, I passed over 3.2 million measurements on uh, the uh, on the website and on the app. So um, if you have any questions on that, I'll be also the person to answer any questions because I feel very passionate about uh, aquarium uh, parameter keeping. That is so cool. Yeah, that's that's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> that's a lot wow. of uh, 3.2 million. That's that's a lot. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, and then again, Dimitri, this is the first Inspire event that we're putting on. Um, you know, the whole goal of this event is to inspire people to, to get, you know, get into the aquarium hobby and, and try something new and set up, you know, whether it's a large tank or a, a desktop tank. So we appreciate you uh, giving all this information because that's the biggest thing with this hobby is the amount of information that yep. people can consume to be a better Aquarius. And it's obvious that you're very passionate about this. So. Um, we do, do appreciate you joining us today. Uh, uh, Richard and Jessica, I really appreciate it as well. Um, I, as parting words, I just want to say that, honestly, I still have no idea what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of those things where in this copy, everything is anecdotal. Uh, if I would just kind of part with some last advice is that uh, figure out what works for you as, a, as an aquarist. Uh, and uh, try to get information from all the sources, but at the end, everybody's aquarium is going to be unique. Um, I'm still learning every single day. This is what fascinates me about uh, this hobby and interacting with other aquarists and learning from them. This is extremely rewarding as well as sharing. And I'm humbled and uh, appreciative of uh, your support, uh, the viewers, and also all the viewers on my YouTube channel and all the things that people say. I appreciate every single kind word. You deserve it. You do amazing stuff. And, yeah. you know, I think you're a great source to learn from. So you're going to inspire a lot of people today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you. We love. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> amazing interview. <laughs> Keenan, you got me messed up back there. We love Dimitri's aquariums. We are so happy. that Huge he's supporter of Waterbox. Yeah, he's he's absolutely cool. Um, and he's actually going to be doing the Q&A. He's been doing a lot in the chat and talking to you guys, but he's going to come on and actually take some more questions, mm -hmm. talk to you in person. And we really appreciate him coming in for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And there he is, the man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> um, great right. show, guys. Yeah. Great show. I will yeah. say, I've been watching the comments, I've been watching this, and the amount of feedback and positivity towards you your channel people loving you you know and how many people actually use aquatic log like yeah, it's, yeah, it's been pretty cool nothing but such great feedback to you and you've been responding to so many people in here it's really nice to see such a positive everything this is a very unique stream too dimitri because i think this is the first time that like we have you in there commenting yep and then all of a sudden you're here with us live <laughs> <laughs> i don't think we've done that i'm uh same as cor uh, Coral, uh, I learned how to clone myself. So there is actually <laughs> two different Dimitris up there. Uh, one of them is doing this and the other one is typing. I've always wanted to clone myself. That would be so much more efficient around here. Um, teach me your secrets. But I, we're going to jump into the Q&A because I know people are definitely waiting for that. Um, and Keen is going to go ahead and start throwing some questions up there. Oh, and Rachel... Questions and comments. Both. Questions and comments. Okay. Yeah, and I'll read those off for you, Dimitri. Thanks. Adriana says, makes me want another one, another water box, I'm assuming. How many does she have? 
That says a lot because Adriana is well known uh, up in Canada as well, and she's got I don't know three, four, five, maybe five now, and one of them's a custom water box. Yeah. Excellent. What water box would you recommend for a beginner? All in one with a sump? What's a good starter size? You know what? Uh, this is an excellent question. Um, I thought a little bit about it during the um, Q&A session, and I think I would go for the Marine X series. Uh, I love the all-in-ones, um, but I find that maybe it's a little bit on the edge. Uh, if somebody wants to start with their first tank and just want to um, wet their toes, then probably an all-in-one is a great solution. But if somebody feels that they may be a little bit more serious and see themselves um, for years down the line owning a reef aquarium, I think you're gonna make it so much easier where you have a dedicated sump and you can hide all the equipment there and maybe then all in one becomes your second aquarium or third. Um, I can tell you I'm tempted. I'm just fighting myself not to get yet another aquarium because the next one is probably going to be all in one because I'd put it in you know my little room somewhere and uh, it just serves different needs. So to answer the question, I would advise for uh, one of the probably Marine X series, um, a 90 or a 60, or um, if you can swing it 110. Um, that's what I would go because this is where you can start keeping all of the cool fish, in my opinion. I totally agree with that. I think yeah, the Marine X is yeah. one of the more popular models for getting into it because yeah. it is a manageable size, you know, price and everything's good, and it's not as overwhelming. But like you said, you can still do a ton of different corals and fish and have a lot of space in there. Yeah, it's the perfect place to start for sure. We have a Peninsula 25 and wish we had started it out bigger. That's, that's typical, right? Um, I would, um, th so many tanks that I've had, actually I've shared the link in the um, comment section to Aquatic Log where you can actually see every single aquarium that I've kept and um, there's probably at least 20 of them, uh, some of them were small, um, but most of the time a small tank only lasts for this long because you always want to go a little bit bigger. Um, maybe don't start with what I have right now, but remember <laughs> also that it took me about 15 years <laughs> to, to get there. That's true. You don't stick with a small tank usually for very long. <laughs> no, it always gets upgraded. Thinking about building a Waterbox 50 all-in-one cold water tank, ever, ever used a chiller with a Waterbox? Any suggestions? A cold water yeah. tank. That's cool. Yeah. So, so this is this is pretty cool. A uh, little fact: uh, I actually do have a cold water tank in my household. Um, of we do keep an axolotl, um, and the axolotl requires um, temperature that's rather cool. Um, and for this one, we're just using fans. The fan, fans are blowing over the water surface, and because of the evaporation, the water temperature drops uh, quite significantly. <clears throat> but for uh, like a really temperate uh, cold water aquarium, uh, what I've learned, I've never kept one. Um, I heard that you need really thick glass, a lot of times it's acrylic, just because of the um, condensation that would be forming on the window. Um, I would probably recommend going to a place like Reef to Reef and see learning from people that actually have done it. But overall, it's a pretty cool uh, idea. Why not? They're very rare because I think it's hard to find the stuff that goes with them, but a lot of considerations go into actually maintaining or setting it up and, you know, equipment and stuff. Yeah, I, I just came back from Boston uh, and um, it was quite phenomenal to see some of those cold water aquariums. It's a completely different uh, ball of wax. It's uh, different colored anemones. Um, good luck finding or sourcing them, uh, you, yeah. you know, wherever you are because <laughs> most stores won't carry it. Yeah. But, um, you know, you got to stray off the beaten path, I think, sometimes. That's what makes this hobby so much fun. Very Martin's true. asking you, Dimitri, how do you quarantine your fish? That's an excellent question, Martin. And um, over time, uh, my thought on this have changed. Now, I uh, have been doing it long enough where if you go way back, like 10 years ago, well, in some of my videos, I've lost uh, in some of my tanks, which was like 100 gallon aquariums, I've lost all of my fish just because I went and I bought 
one single fish that had, let's say, marine velvet or some sort of a disease, and all it took is just wipe it out. Now, over the years, have I uh, introduced new fish directly into aquarium? Yes, and I've never really, knock on wood, had this particular problem. Um, but most of the time, I now pay attention to what the fish looks like when it's in the store. Uh, I always, I've learned one other thing is to always feed the fish. Um, you don't want to buy a fish uh, without seeing it being fed at the store. Um, and then you have quarantine boxes that sometimes you want to put in uh, just so that other fish don't attack it. But having said that, I do keep uh, a dedicated fish uh, quarantine system as well as get a dedicated coral quarantine system. Um, and I have recently introduced a lot more fish into this aquarium, every single one of them. I quarantine for about, say, uh, 7 to 14 days. I do not use any medication uh, personally um, because, you know, if something really bad is there, I think the fish is going to die um, before that. And then I risk it for the end, for the rest. Great question, Martin. We appreciate that. Um, Aqua Reefs TV is asking, my clownfish is worse than my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Always biting as soon as my hand is in the water. They can be pretty aggressive. Yeah, but you can't uh, train a tra clownfish. You can probably train your dog. But yeah. <laughs> the clownfish, no go. Uh, I have the same problem with my clownfish. Um, they do nip at, at me, but I heard horrible stories about maroon clownfish, which are the big ones. Those ones can actually uh, uh, cause some serious damage. Yeah, I had a maroon clownfish for maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. He was very aggressive. Yeah, one of the stores <clears throat> I worked at had like a about 40-year-old clownfish. And that guy would go right between the knuckles anytime you went into his tank. And he was in one of the selling tanks, so you always went in there. It was one of the just, ORA breeders. It was one of the ORA breeders that originally came in back like in the 70s or whatever. And he would just like grab and twist and rip between your knuckles. Always had <laughs> bites and bleeding. Maroon. Is that fish still alive, do you know? Yes. He is. The wow. female is not, but the male still is. So it puts them at what? 50? Yeah, 50, 40, 50, 50 year, year old, old clownfish. That's pretty cool. Yeah. How many gallons, uh, Daryl's asking, how many gallons in total do all your tanks add up to? Ooh. So I did share the answer in the comments. It's one of those things. It's the same question as when they ask you how much you spend on the equipment. You just don't <laughs> say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm close to 600 gallons uh, total. Like this uh, bad boy is uh, 340 gallons total water volume, uh, maybe without rock and everything else closer to 300. And then my coral farm is easily uh, 300 gallons, um, maybe a little bit more. So at least 600 gallons of salt water um, that I keep after, wow. uh, look after. <laughs> That's nice. Have you ever uh, done freshwater or has it always been saltwater aquariums? Excellent question. Um, so I have uh, kept so many freshwater tanks. Um, so I have my stripes. I've uh, done regular tropical. I've done uh, cichlids. Um, I'm a, a Tanganyika purist uh, for those of you who are cichlid lovers. I've also done planted aquariums, um, different styles, iwagumi, you name it. Uh, a lot of them I have documented on my YouTube channel as well. And um, I uh, was really inspired by the water box on Tuesday where um, it was all about fresh water because while I love salt water and you, you know, I walk the walk, uh, part of me would uh, easily uh, get back into fresh water. I absolutely love it. I think there's nothing like a nicely aquascaped freshwater uh, aquarium with um, probably just a group of uh, cardinal fish and some epistogramma um, mixed in. I see a clear or an Eden in Dimitri's future coming up yeah. here. <clears throat> I, I'm not going to lie, Dimitri. I started in freshwater as a very young kid. Um, and then obviously that transitioned into saltwater. And it was many, many years until I started dabbling back into freshwater. But these planted tanks, I'm not going to lie, I'm hooked. They're really cool. Um, especially when you get into the high-tech stuff and you can yeah. keep lots of different like carpeting types of plants. It's pretty awesome. I have a question for you. Have you done discus? I, uh, not only, so I'm the same as you, um, I have not done them. Uh, I, know I was this like, is I the need advice from Dimitri because I want to do discus. <laughs> yeah, and 
they had me at the 50% water changes uh, on a weekly basis. I'm sorry, this is kind of where I draw the line. <laughs> I love discus, um, but I think also um, I'm a lot more interested in the fish behavior. So for me, it's either give me a school of fish and just kind of go this way or give me like some really interesting fish uh, like cichlids where uh, there's a lot more mm -hmm. interesting things to observe. Yeah. All right, not getting my advice from him on that one. All right. <laughs> Besides vacuuming regularly, are there any other ways to keep sand white and clean? That's a very, very good question. I've uh, been banging my head uh, on this one for a while, and I'm doing something a little bit different. Um, if you go back about a month ago in my YouTube channel, uh, it's probably one of my absolute favorite videos that I've done. I've interviewed a gentleman named Carl uh, with a beautiful aquarium that has the best looking sand bed that I have seen. It's a very large aquarium and it's just pristine. And he claims that um, the result is just um, one uh, diamond goby that really goes uh, to town with, uh, with, with this sand. Um, it inspired me so much that I actually got a diamond goby and I quarantined it. Well, I actually lost like two or three of them for uh, because that's the point of quarantine. But I've introduced a diamond goby in this aquarium behind me. There's one. I love them and I'm probably going to get at least two more. And then uh, let's see where it um, takes this aquarium maybe in, uh, in a few weeks or months. This is one of the reasons I always document what I do is so that others can actually learn um, from my experiments. And um, I think this is primarily what I would like to do because just going in with the um, vacuum is a little bit uh, too much for me. This is true. And I saw a couple of comments in here. So sand sifting gobies are amazing at keeping your sand bed clean. But I have a lot of people say, oh, they put sand on all your corals and stuff. But there's a big distinct difference between a diamond goby and a golden head sleeper goby. So the golden head sleeper gobies like take a big mouthful of sand and then they swim up into the water column and just take it and sprinkle it everywhere. And they make a disastrous mess. Diamond gobies like pick it up, drop it. Pick it up and drop it. They yeah, stay filter. close to the sand surface. So there is a big difference. If you get a diamond head or a golden sleeper or whatever, no, golden sleeper goby, yep. they will cover your whole tank with sand. Mm, that's a good tip. That was exactly what I told, and this is exactly the reason uh, why I went with uh, the diamond. Go yes. Uh, Martin's asking, Dimitri, do you have a cover for your tank, like a, a lid? That's the reason uh, I got this particular tank. I've <laughs> never had a lid. I'm so lazy to, you know, like go in and buy those kits and, and, and do it yourself. I don't think I ever wanted to do that um, even though I had a beautiful rimless tanks before this particular one just comes with it and uh, I'm, I'm so happy because yes uh, it's awesome I love it um, I've lost actually diamond gobies because of that because they would jump from my other aquariums and uh, once you go with cover I don't think you're, you're going anywhere back like I'm intent to keep a lot of fish that were just completely off limits for me such as firefish and I also had my tanks jump, so this is now um, an opportunity for me to um, to go next level because there's nothing more annoying than getting a fish, uh, quarantining it, introducing it, and then never seeing it again um, in, in a tank, even a, a four-footer. And it could be because the fish is just shy and just somewhere in the rocks, or it may have jumped um, last night and then you're just going to wait for two weeks until you actually find it behind the tank or yeah. when you yeah. move it. That's yep. a good point with the LX, it does include the lids, but the cool thing is about the LX, you don't see it. You can't mm -hmm. tell it's there because it sits in that little bit of recess with the Euro brace. You wouldn't even know that there's a lid on there. Yeah. Gene's asking, do you use manganese supplements for your Ghani health, so for the Ghanapora? Yeah, uh, I actually read some of the comments before, like uh, during the, uh, the first part of the video, and uh, I must relate. Um, I'm just not good with uh, gonies as well. I've heard a lot of things about manganese and uh, for gonies or for torches. Um, I try to maintain a good level of uh, magnesium and um, uh, manganese in my, in my aquariums. As a matter of fact, um, if you go to 
the link for aquatic log, you can actually see every single parameter that I've ever taken for every single aquarium. I always, always make them public and you can see what they were and you can, or I can try to correlate it with the videos. Uh, having said that, I've never done anything specific for Gonis. I think it's just uh, a good husbandry and uh, maybe not too much flow. And um, the most important part for me was where you get the goni from. Because a lot of times when you get uh, maybe a goni from the store, you have no idea what the health of it is. And uh, if it's gonna die, it probably may have already been um, kind of on the way out and there's nothing that you could have done differently. I'm really lucky to have this uh, red goni. It's my favorite and the only goni that I have. Uh, all of my green gonies died. I have no idea why. That's interesting, the specific colors. Is, have you found that? that no, Ghanaians are talented. And like you said, your source where you got it from and knowing mm -hmm. anything, like one caught from the wild is going to be much harder to trans yeah. transition in, feeding schedule and all of that stuff. And those big ball Ghanaians that are from the wild, their nutrient like food requirements are so high, high that they yeah. slowly starve to death in most people's aquarium. Getting the aquacultured ones tend to be your best success mm -hmm. versus wild. So I think that has a lot to play into it as far as long-term success for people too, is how is it cultivated? How long has it been in captivity if it is wild? Has it already starved so far that it's not gonna kind of recover back even with heavy feeding? So there's a lot of variables in purchase through when you get it. Correct. Dimitri, Leo is asking, how do you clean the back of your water box, like the back panel? Dive. <laughs> That's where, um, okay, so I, I actually know somebody um, that has a very large aquarium. Um, it's closer to uh, over 600 gallons where a person actually puts on uh, the slippers and uh, gets in uh, to clean the back glass. Um, I am not there yet, maybe for my next tank. But uh, I would say this is probably a bit of a downside uh, with uh, such a large aquarium because uh, my arms are fairly long. I can kind of get uh, on each side about two and a half feet, give or take, and then the rest closer to the overflow, it's impossible to get in with a magnet. So I usually just go in and try to get as much as possible with a magnet. And then maybe once every uh, two, three weeks, I take a uh, scraper or like a blade on a stick and then it's a lot more uh, tedious, but you have to do it. And then you just kind of get in and uh, uh, slowly and, and meticulously clean the rest of the glass. But mm -hmm. it's worth it uh, because I love a, a nice dark black uh, background. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> me too. I love the glass to be completely clean. <clears throat> what is your oldest coral colony? That's a very good question. I would say, it's hard to say whether it's a colony. I guess it is a colony. All the way on the left, I have uh, probably one of my absolute favorite uh, corals. It's a brain coral that has been with me for close to 10 years, I would say. When I got it, it was less than the size of my fist. It's a lot bigger. A lot of times it was kind of on the way out and then it came back. So I have a, quite an attachment to it as well. I would say this is probably uh, the coral that's you know, still kind of in one piece as opposed to, uh, I have so many corals here. So every single coral that you see here has been grown by yours truly out of a small frag. Uh, last time I think I bought, like I, I, I haven't bought a uh, colony um, in years, maybe seven or eight years. So everything I grow, but then what does it constitute to be a, um, a, a an age aged colony because if I have grown something to a large colony and I broke off a frag and put it back in, is it the same coral or not? Uh, it's the same question as uh, the traveling uh, ship. Uh, if some of you may know what that is, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. I mean, the 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 fact that all of those corals have been grown by you from frags is really impressive because these days. There was a time where you could buy corals like that that you see in your tank at that size, but those days are long gone. So yes, and that's a large aquarium. So like these corals don't look tiny in there. So you know, yeah. like in real life, those They're colonies big. are big. Like yeah. you know, for them to get to a small frag up to that size. Yeah. Gene's asking. 
Gene is asking, do you run a UV and what does that schedule look like? Uh, I do not run a UV. Uh, however, in the past, I've ran UV in my farm. Um, a few years ago, when I was just setting up my farm, I've ran into a few issues where it hit the um, low nutrients and I had some dinos. And this is where I used a very cheap UV that you can get for, uh, say, 60 or $50 off of Amazon. And it helped me uh, get through that stage. But on a regular basis, I do not. I still very much believe in UV. I just uh, have never really figured out how I would hook it up. And most of my husbandry is not specific to UV. Good answer. Got anything else, Keenan? OK, here we go. What, what's your favorite place to buy fish in Canada? That's a good question. We have a lot of people from Canada Ooh, watching. You're, you're going to get me in trouble. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> you can say oh, I'm not answering. You can say no comment. <laughs> No, you know what? I will. Uh, uh, I'll. So there's a few places, um, and I actually think very highly of uh, quite a few amazing stores uh, here in Canada, especially in Toronto. Um, I am happy to be uh, a good friend with many of them, and uh, I, like I said, some really good stuff. Uh, but I will also say that. Uh, they're also at the mercy of uh, their suppliers. So a lot of times you can get really, really good fish, but uh, if it was just not a very good transit, you may run into an issue. But I will also say that the last fish I bought was from uh, Ron at Big Al's at uh, Young and Steel's. So shout out to uh, Big Al's North York. Uh, this is where uh, I got my last fish. Hi. Nice. Yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah. It's always good. That we, we get a lot of that in, in Canada, asking where to buy, like where's the best place to buy certain things. So, yep. Johnny's saying that your app is amazing and thank you for that. Thank <laughs> you. This is, um, it's now 11th year that I've been working on it. Uh, you're looking at uh, him. I'm, I do all of the development for website as well as iPhone and Android applications. I pour my heart and soul in it um, on the weekends and on the evenings, and uh, I still develop uh, regularly, adding new features and modernizing it. So that means a lot. Thank you very much. Such a helpful Aquatic thing log. for hobbyists. Uh, like yeah. I have a ton of people I've seen. They're like, "Oh, downloading this now, downloading. Yeah. I can't wait to use this. How cool, you know?" And then some people are like, "I've used this for two years. It's the best app." Yeah. So I feel like you're gonna have a lot more people. Jumping on as users, but just getting a lot more recognition. Yeah, and Dimitri, I never it. told you this, but long before I even met you, I used Aquatic Log. So boom. <laughs> oh, <that's>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what goes around comes around, Richard. Yeah, <laughs> there absolutely. You go. All right, we got one more. One question. more question for you. Bring it on. What other What other pets do you have besides fish? Oh, that is a. And, or, I like that. And one. or corals. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, that's that's a very good question. Um, I we do have an axolotl, which is technically not a fish uh, or a coral. Um, I also have a, um, a go goby. Um, so we have uh, goby in the family. Um, but uh, I also have a dog, and it's a chocolate lab, and uh, he nice. is uh, a menace. Oh, and he just heard his name. <laughs> uh, you can just see his tail right over there. So uh, I don't know how serendipity he was in his uh, cage, but when uh, you asked that question, he decided to uh, come up. So that was a very good question. <laughs> He's like, it's my time to shine. I'm calling yep. if you like it yep. or not. That's a, Chocolate Labs are really good dogs. That's awesome. Ready? Yes, and he's uh, right here. <laughs> Maybe a little large Excellent. to pick up, but Dimitri, we greatly appreciate you spending not only the time with us to do the interview, but also the time with us today live. We, we greatly appreciate everything. Um, it's you're, such a great experience, yeah. learning so much, and I know everyone here that's been watching has loved every second of it. Yeah, absolutely. So we look forward to watching this Reef LX, you know, mature over the years and see where it goes. So thank, thank you. you. I really appreciate the opportunity as well. It was an amazing stream, and uh, I just want to say uh, the vibes in the comments are phenomenal. This is exactly what I love to see in the community. This is very similar to what I see in my YouTube uh, comments. 
uh, let's uh, give lots of love uh, out there. So really yeah. appreciate what you guys are doing and uh, looking for many more years uh, of a water box experience. I'm inspired. Thank love you. It. Love it. Thank you, Dimitri. Bye. All right. That was very inspiring. I saw a lot of people saying that they were inspired. They want a big tank. They want to go yeah. larger. Uh, you know, it's just so neat to see the transformation between what he's done for the mm -hmm. beginning through now and different water boxes. So um, definitely really enjoyed that interview. Yeah, and I think that tank's got a, a long way to go. He's going to get that thing looking It's, it's so new still. Like, uh -huh. it's like it's so new. stuff getting settled. So it isn't even seen its time to fully shine. Yep. But um, we have, of course, our announcers for the giveaway to yep. yeah. Give, we, yeah. we got some winners? Yes, we got three drum rolls because it's easier than not. Okay. <laughs> all right. We've been confused all week. All right. We are going to announce each one separately, but it is time to announce some winners for the gift card winners. Let's give away some money. Woo! Ready? Number one. Jordan Freeman. Congratulations, Jordan. Woo! They will reach out to you here shortly and get you that gift card, and you can go buy all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah, check out all the new products. We didn't rent quick. We did rent, release a lot of products this week, so mm -hmm. check those out also. All right, winner number two. Number two. Ready? Justin Adams. Woo! Congratulations, Justin. I wonder if they're in here with us. I feel like those names are familiar. Yeah. Maybe. It's hard to say. Hopefully, some like of them how more exciting. Are. To like hear your name announced versus just wait to get an email and realize yeah. you won. That's why you should be tuning in. Always tune in. Yep. All right. So we have one more winner for the gift card. One more. You ready? Let's go. Mohammed Shaheed. Congratulations, Congratulations. Mohammed. Woo! Um, we'll reach out to all you guys. If you guys haven't already, there's a lot of you in here. Smash that like button for me. Throw an elbow at it. Punch it. You know, flip it in the air. Do all that stuff, and then tell us how you. How you did it as don't well. break your electronics, please. <laughs> They're gonna be real mad. Um, and don't forget that the sales are still going on all the way through the 22nd. So check those out. Up to 20% off of aquariums and supplies in the U.S., yeah. U.K., Europe, and Canada. Yep. yep so that in the wrong order. Um, so definitely don't Normally miss out I on say that. that so I know. That's jump all, on that's in here. I think that's it. But we're back here tomorrow. We are. We are back here tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. right? Yes. Tomorrow is exciting because. You, if you are watching on Facebook right now, just get over to YouTube tomorrow because there's going to be live voting and Rich and I are going head to head in an aquascaping battle for fresh water. And you guys. Where's the are, belt? It's for the belt. I don't know where it is, belt? but. It's down there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Oh, God. I'm attached. <laughs> <laughs> You're for, tethered. <laughs> I am tethered. Um, it is for my championship belt, and we're going to have a live scape off. Mm -hmm. So your vote on YouTube only is going to determine the winner and who gets the belt. Yep. So Plus we're on. giving away gift cards, so you know. Yeah, yeah. Tons, tons of giveaways, really cool aquascaping competition. It's going to be pretty silly, so uh, definitely tune in tomorrow at 6 p.m. We, oh, we appreciate you guys tuning in with us this week. We're on day four, day yep. five's tomorrow, so. Yep. And we'll see you tomorrow. Yep. Better. Make sure to smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell. Inspire sales are live until April 22nd. Up to 20% off in the USA, Canada, United Kingdom, and Europe. Financing is available with rates as low as 0% for 24 months. Join us tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern for our next Inspire stream.